Okay, first of all, I need to thank uh, Stephen Jay for his ongoing support of our show in this show, in this particular case, uh, which is an interview with Tom Dunley. And I'm just putting this lead onto it uh, because I forgot to thank uh, him. And also, we ran out of time in the video. Uh, we ran out of disk space, I guess is what it was. So I don't exactly know at this point how this thing will end. Mr. Producer's still working on it. If we lose stuff at the end, we'll try to pick up again with a different video. Maybe do a little bit of a series. And what I'd really like you to do, if you don't mind thinking it through with me, is after you've heard this one, maybe have further questions, uh, things we might converse about between us. One of the things we found, of course, was that the... <clears throat> conversation we had was very catalytic. It really caused us to remember a lot of things that were useful. And uh, in particular, what the value of this whole show is that you're about to see is just that um, uh, connection Mr. Gemmell had to the, uh, to, the, to the history of, you know, to, to the longer history in a, in a continuing lineage of, through those painters uh, that he worked with. So um, I think I'll leave it at that. Enjoy the show. Again, thank you, Stephen Jay. Hey, welcome back. Here we are again, um, trying to <laughs> trying to entertain and educate a little teeny bit, but um, specifically trying to share with you some of the Boston School of values and ways of thinking, as you all know. But I'm here today, uh, as and you've had, and with a guest, and you've experienced this guest before. This is Tom Dunley, and it's already on your screen, I'm sure. So um, I just want to welcome you, Tom, to the uh, to the show. And I think what we're going to do today uh, is just go ahead and talk about. Uh, Tom's going to share some of his pictures, so you know what I'm talking to. You have some idea. I know bunches of you guys probably went online and looked at his material anyway. After it's so easy to do now um, on his website, but um, but I think what we'll do is just introduce you, let him show some pictures, and I'll, I think what I might do is ask some, if you don't mind, Tom, ask some interview type questions. Uh, oh, absolutely. You know, especially particular to the uh, to the to the uh, conversation that was around uh, those works with Gamel. So, um, so I might I'm, I'm going to try to be a good guy and look at you guys once in a while, but I'm probably just going to forget and stay focused on Tom. And I'm hoping Mr. Producer doesn't have too much of a problem with that. He'll probably look like a genius as usual. But all right. I managed to finally get my studio warm enough today. And um, but now it's getting hot. <laughs> now that I'm overdressed. <laughs> All right, let's let's go on and stop being silly. Um, so, Tom, um, why don't we um, just introduce you? Why don't we why don't, why don't we give you give a, you're 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 a data mass uh, kid, and you're give us the sort of the beginning of the Gamel thing. You talked a little bit about that before, but when did you get to Gamel? And uh, give us a little bit of that background. Um, um, I, I graduated history. Yeah, yeah. I, I I was born in Weymouth, Mass, uh, down on the South Shore. I um, graduated from high school in 1969, and I wasn't sure about what I wanted to do. I I always had wanted to be a painter, but I hadn't really committed to you know going in that direction. So at the last minute, I, I decided I, I'm going to go for it. You know, it's what I really want. So I enrolled at Mass College of Art, uh, September of 1969. And uh, like so many people that have, you know, gone to institutions like that, uh, the minute I walked in the door, I realized I'd made a terrible mistake. Uh, <clears throat> you know, what was going on in the school, you know, wasn't uh, the direction that I was interested in going. It, it, it was all modern art. It was, you know, the place was sort of crazy. <clears throat> it, it was the beginning of conceptual art and just it it's none of it made any sense so well far I, from I, what brought you to the dance at any rate right right uh, you know i have always had traditional values uh, my father was an amateur painter and <clears throat> drew every day um, and you know admired people like sergeant so I, I had a pretty good introduction as a kid you know to good painting and uh, you know what it really was. So when I went to school, I, I, at Mass Art, I was I, I was not shocked, but it just wasn't what I wanted. And so I had a pretty good sense of history. I knew in 1969, what was it, 45 years before Monet had died, Sargent died 44 years before. So it just made sense. <laughs> you've, you've, you've counted that up, have you? <laughs> it, it, if you did the math. 
you you had to figure that there was someone alive who had some connection with that generation of great painters, what, what I call the, the last great generation of painters. So I, I set out on a search. I, I went everywhere. Um, and, and, there, and there wasn't much information out there at all. You know, you, all you really had access to was a little black and white ad in the back of American Artist Magazine, you know, people who were doing a little bit of private teaching. So I, I followed up a lot of leads and uh, I just didn't find anybody. And then at the last minute in my own backyard right here in Boston, <clears throat> three quarters of a mile down the street from where Mass College of Art was, um, someone had recommended that I go see RHI's Camel, and they told me he had, he was running a teaching program, um, an atelier type, sort of not, not an apprenticeship program, but where he had private students who worked closely with him, and he was teaching traditional painting as it had been taught 50, 60 years before. So I, I pursued, um, you know, contacting him, uh, had an appointment like everybody else, you know, to meet him, uh, you know, was grilled on, you know, who I thought were good painters. <clears throat> Fortunately, I, I was able to come up with enough uh, names that um, satisfied his uh, requirements for, you know, you know, whether you had a, you know, good sense of what good painting was, you know, I, I, I admired Sergeant, you know, Benson Paxton, um, Ang, you know, Sir Joshua Reynolds, you know, so I, I, I came up with the, the right names. But at the time, when I first met him, there, there was no room in the studio. It, it wasn't a case of being accepted as a student. <clears throat> uh, I think he liked my attitude, you know, much more than the work that I presented to him. And he, he told me to stick around, you know, hang around in the hallways, um, you know, meet uh, people who were studying with his uh, former student, Robert Hunter. Um, I, I met two of his uh, students, uh, David Lowry and Ernie Principato. And uh, upon meeting them, I realized that this was the kind of environment that I wanted to be in. Huh. Now here were people my relative age, uh, working in a traditional manner, uh, you know, working from life, uh, drawing well, uh, painting well, you know, painting what was before them, the visible world uh, before them. And so I, I, I hung around and uh, eventually after about a year, an opening came available with uh, Mr. Gamble and I was able to, you know, work with him for a good six and a half years on a everyday basis in the studios. Oh, okay. um, but during that year, I, I did study with Bob Hunter, um, you know, one of his primary pupils from the 1950s. So what, uh, Tom, what year did you arrive? I don't know if you said. What... I, I got an invitation to come study with him uh, sometime mid-May of 1972. 72, yeah. Yeah, and I, I worked with him until our first uh, child was born in August of 1978. And the phrase he used is, you know, upon the birth of my first son, Tommy, uh, he said, you've officially graduated. <laughs> <laughs> well, Yes, it always, yes, it's always interesting. I guess much like Gamel saying to me when I got married, he said, just when you leave, just make sure I get the key to your studio. <laughs> like, congratulations, bye. <laughs> Fortunately, he didn't live up to that. Uh, um, well, well and, and the same was, you know, in my case. Uh, I still saw him every single day right. until he died. Yeah, um, yeah. It's just, uh, he, you know, he felt, felt very responsible for the students who were working with him closely. Sure. And by saying you graduated, uh, it was a way of absolving himself of, of any responsibility in case you were hit by a car. Paying your bills <laughs> for your kid's sake, yeah. Sure. No, no, that's very understandable. Yeah, no, that's Is very there... interesting. Yeah. So, what did what did just 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 background? What did what did he set you out doing right off the top? Was that just cast drawing of the? Was that set you in front of a cast? Did he make you do copies? I, what was the specific but, of the first no, I, activity? I have... You know, during that interim year, you know, when I, from the time I first met him until nine, ten months later, when I got an invitation to study, I, I did have the good fortune of working with Bob Hunter, um, you know, in a, a much looser manner. And he, he he basically replicated what Mr. Gamble, you know, would have a very beginning student do. 
So I, I, I drew cast you know, for most of that first winter. It was okay. Very big. But so specifically, what do you mean? You put out words like in a much looser manner. Are you talking about but, his teaching? But, but, a job of the um, way he taught, or what he taught, or the no, whole thing? What? No, it, yeah. it, it, it wasn't as formal. You know, as you oh, remember, right, when right. I became a student of Mr. Gamble's. It, you know, we met every morning at 8 o'clock, right. you know, mapped out our day. We met at the end of the day. Um, you know, every, every, every in, especially in the beginning, every minute of every day was, you know, accounted. Um, where in studying with Bob, it, it was, you know, if you can get a studio in the building, I will give you criticism. And he was very incredibly generous with his time. Right. Uh, you know, he, he was busy. Um, you know, he was a full-time painter, uh, doing a lot of commission work himself and making a living at painting. And, uh, but, you know, Bob, Bob Hunter always, you know, his door was always open uh, to any student. He was, you know, gave very, very freely of his time and, you know, helped many, many people. And uh, it, if it wasn't for Bob, I, I wouldn't have secured my position with Mr. Oh, Gamble. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I think, you know, behind the scenes, he was sort of, <clears throat> he, he was sort of the, uh, you know, the, the uh, guard at the centurion at the door, <laughs> uh, making yeah. sure that- Your handholder you know, maybe would be another way of saying it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Ma making sure that the right people ended up studying with Mr. Gamble, oh, for or, Mr. Gamble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. at least compatible people who would, wouldn't cause trouble and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, he, you know, for that, I'm very, very grateful. Uh, but you know, his, his introduction that first year was, was, you know, something I look back as one of the most valuable experiences I've ever had. Um, not only was the introduction to, you know, drawing cast in the studio, uh, but it was a great introduction to landscape painting. Um, Bob <clears throat> was a much better landscape painter than most people realize, uh, especially back in the, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s. Uh, you know, m much of his work, which is probably in all private collections, uh, you know, has a certain quality to it and a certain truth to it that it was really quite remarkable. So get, getting my first introduction to landscape painting from him was, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's just an invaluable experience. I've never seen early landscapes by him, uh, Tom. Are, were those similar to what he did when we saw lots of them being knocked out at the end there? Is that a fairly similar approach? They, they were very different. They were much more carefully uh, oh, studied, yeah. uh, much, much more truthful, I think. Yeah. Uh, you know, very, you know, they were made, you know, they were made out of paint. Yeah, um, yeah I know what you mean. Worked on over a sustained period of time. Uh, they weren't one-shot deals. Um, well, you had yeah, the Henchy background. Was that showing through the, the, the impressionist yeah, it, uh, color? It was. His, yeah. his color back then, uh, those, uh, you know, 1960s and 1970s landscapes, you know, the color coloring was beautiful on them. Mm. But never seen he, I, yeah. the thing that really stands out most was that he, he pushed them. Yeah. You know, he... He, he worked on them, you know, over a period of time and, you know, really made an effort to make a picture out of it as opposed to a, a yeah. study. Yeah, or knocking something off. You know, um, Hunter, Bob Hunter was a student with Gamble. I'm just mentioning it to you, the audience, the, the viewers, my friends. That uh, era was 1954 or so when he was with Gamble. So right. just so you know, there's a whole generation virtually. It was 20 years or so before. I was in the army, by the way, stuck in the army while you were having your fun. <laughs> that first bit of time there, just to put something in perspective. But anyway, when did, when did you get out of the army? Seventy-three. Seventy-three. Yeah. Wow. Then I was at the Art Students League for those two or three years after that. So, yeah. um, and before before Tom was one of the guys that came down to to New York uh, at the invitation of a friend from the Henchy experience, maybe a friend of Tom of, of David Lowry's. Uh, I almost just remembered his name, but that would have been nice if I had remembered it. But, um, and he invited you guys, you all went to Chinatown or whatever, and I wound up being invited, but he, he was he was purposely connecting me with you guys because of the nasty things I was saying <laughs> in the cafeteria about the failures, failures to, to teach drawing at the art students. <laughs> and of course, I met academic drawing and all that sort of old stuff, you know, when you, once you've been around a little bit. It was found in their catalogs, though, in the basement of the art students. Like, um, that's... That's why I knew they weren't teaching very well because nobody was drawing that way. Right. And there were beautiful things, the kind of stuff that would... Um, 
Well, the, the interesting thing is, I think just about every student who came to study with Mr. Gamble came as a result of searching out someone like him because of the bad teaching they were experiencing. Yeah, I, I know yeah, yeah. our case, uh, you know, David Lowry, every, everybody. Yeah. Well, the uh, guy that, um, in all the noise making I was doing, there was a guy that had lived in Boston and had an opportunity to study with Gamma when he was under 15. And uh, there was something about the experience of meeting him and everything that was totally daunting. I think it scared the hell out of him one way or another. And it just, just could be that he wasn't that serious about it. But I met him as a student at the Art Students. Like he was a 65, almost retired uh, head of the, uh, uh, I was an art director at the, um, at the uh, Reader's Digest. But he had Gamel's book, and he said, you might want to read this. And he told me about his background, having had an opportunity to potentially study with Gamel, and then he chose a different path. But, and that was what got me even more irritated, so, as you know. <laughs> you know and, then, and then talking more. And, then, of course, that led to this young man that was in the Brackman class with me talking about you guys and Henry and all that stuff. And, and, uh, I, I also find it amazing how many people stumbled onto Twilight of Painting, either in a library or mm -hmm, someone mm -hmm. recommended that they read it, and that eventually led to them coming to Mr. Gamble to study with them. It wasn't a small number. I think they, I think either 63 or 67,000 of those books went out. So mm -hmm. it's a pretty decent number. I found one in, the Denver, in a Denver used bookstore. <laughs> so they did get around, you know, whatever. Oh, they, they did. They, and, they're probably deaccession from libraries they were sent to. <laughs> and they, and and now the uh, you know the original edition the hardcovers you know they can sell for as much as five hundred dollars a piece on sure online. yeah yeah and yeah it'd be worth it it'd be worth every penny it's of it. an incredible book I I have it right here on my coffee table <laughs> I I've, I think I've looked at it every day for fifty years can you reach it hold it up it's it's right here let's show it off I want I, you have the you don't have the um, you don't have the original cover but show the frontispiece. Oh, very good. Very good. He signed it for you. It's, uh, I, I, I will read it. <clears throat> to the painter born or unborn who shall lift the art of painting from the low estate to which it has fallen, <laughs> this book is hopefully dedicated. There you go. Beautiful. Show, <laughs> the, show the picture at the front. The, the, the big painting. When, remember we were... The we, Reno? The Reno, yeah. Is uh, that, is that you, in the front of that? My, my dust jacket is uh, gone. Oh, isn't it also the frontispiece, though? I thought it was the first photograph as well. Uh, no, oh, that's right. Let me, let me check. If it isn't, then I'm, it, yeah. It is. Yeah, there it is. Oh, good. There you all. So, so that, that was my experience. A little wild, you know, it's a little unnerving, actually. But there's a, um, but that painting, which is about 10 feet high or so, uh, was it buried the whole time Gamma was alive at, at, yeah. at the, um, at the uh, Museum of Fine Arts? They own the thing. And you know, a huge number or a significant number of those pictures are all just out of uh, either ours or the Met, you know, collections in, 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 in the States. You know, the, the uh, imagine, I'm sorry, the um, academic type work in particular. Anyway, Tom, I didn't mean to go there. I want to talk about your stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I wanted to, no, no. uh, yeah, I just wanted people, you know, so in the course though, you learned other things with Gamel, like you were, you were uh, put under the memory drawing uh, exercises and yeah, you know within the first month or so uh, memory drawing was uh something you know he talked quite a bit about he uh yeah. it, it's interesting he he recommended it he told us to do it uh he didn't demand of it yeah. as much yeah. as you would think he did yeah uh, I, I i look back now and i i realize you know i i wish i had done more at that time but yeah. the incredible value yeah. that memory drawing has i mean with my own students today I, I make it mandatory that they do memory drawing. Yeah, good. Uh, and they send me a text message every night before ten o'clock with what they've done, and it it sort of keeps them on. Oh, you're you're a stinker. Well, <laughs> you know it's it's funny if they they know that they're expected to, you know, send you a text. With, yeah. But they yeah they tend to do it, and I, I have I have a couple of students. I have I have one student, a, a woman who, I, you know, I. I never thought she'd learn to draw. So I, I had her stop working in the studio and just dedicate herself to memory drawing for six months. And uh -huh. now back in the studio, you know, doing some very good work. Good, it's nice. Really quite amazing the uh, profound effect that serious effort in the area of memory drawing can have on your work. 
So Tom, uh, you'd be in the studio typically doing still life, and it was from Gamble that we heard the words from Reynolds that anybody who can do a still life can do anything. Uh, <laughs> did you remember hearing that from Gamble's I, mouth? I, I, I do, I do. Because, you know, it was so easy to, especially someone like me who'd been painting the figure for three years, to suddenly feel demoted. And I don't mean to say it bothered me in any way because the information he was evidently, very evidently, um, informed with was going to be worth any sacrifice. But, um, but so what did he say to you at that point about the still life or how did he, how did he get you moving in that direction? Going to give, I'm just trying to get insight out there for people out here who, who just have a little bit of gamble as a myth and uh, I mean, I, flesh it out I, I was 19 at the time. So, um, uh, I, I simply, you know, followed directions. I, I did what I was told. <laughs> um, of course. Yeah. But, you know, we, we were being exposed to some extraordinary things that were coming available for the first time in many, many years. The, the Paxton Estate, which Mr. Gamble technically inherited, 160 paintings by William Paxton. Uh, that was coming out of the warehouse for the first time in over 40 years. And these pictures, which were probably three quarters of them, you really could consider masterpieces. Uh, we were seeing for the first time. Um, wow. Wow. So, you know, the, the visible world, visual world, you know, as, as you know, Paxton saw and interpreted it, uh, you know, was something that was was part of the everyday lexicon. Right. Uh, you know, we were looking at these pictures. And, I, you know, I, I what I got most out of the very early still lifes was, uh, you know, an appreciation and understanding of how beautiful nature, meaning just, you know, objects appearing and, you know, their everyday conditions on, under natural light, uh, how, how beautiful it was. And yeah. uh, it was very, you know, very hard to, uh, you know, in, to un understand, you know, what he was talking about uh, in, in, in terms of, you know, putting down nature the way it appears as, to, as opposed to how you think nature should look or how you think things should look you know the whole understanding of lost and found um, you know was something that you know, was it was a constant part of you know the criticism all, all the time so when you, know, you use that in, in in the context of a still life when did um, he use the lost and found just let's take that one item because that sort of fleshes out things that i use of course all the time with my students right um i, I mean the, the most often made quote and i'm sure you know you're you quote this to your students all the time with Joseph DeCamp, you know, it's an opportunity to lose an edge. And, you know, I, I think that the, the Boston painters, um, it wasn't a case of just arbitrarily losing things or, or blending things. Um, you know, they, they really, uh, you know, had brought the uh, of observation of how nature appeared to an incredibly high level and, you know, if you look at Joseph de Camp's blue cup painting, uh, you know, when you get back the proper distance that he probably observed it from, you know, it looks very much like nature. But when you go up and you see it, you know, would stick your nose into the picture, uh, you, you realize that, you know, that it, it required an incredible amount of understanding of how, how to place the shapes and values, uh, you know, to make something uh come out in the picture or disappear into the picture. So that, so that, but, that, but in the, you know, one of the things I do, Tom, is I talk about lost and found as a virtual method. And this idea of coming out of the fog was another one of those things that's, that's related. And I, and I, but I've come to the conclusion that Richard Lack and I have totally different views of what that is. And I don't mean, I'm not picking on anybody. I just, it's an interesting thing that you can work with somebody and actually not, and come away with a different, idea about a, a concept like that and how it relates to your to your methodology i i believe <laughs> that you gotta stay positive here i know you like i know you like lack so this is gonna be okay <laughs> no I, I i believe that there's maybe not so much through lack but his students i i believe that there is a term with many of them a tremendous misunderstanding yeah. of what Mr. Gamble was teaching and the Boston School Method in general, and, and in general, uh, an understanding of what Boston painters were doing, 
foot in what Mr. Gamble was teaching. Yeah. Yep. I, I, I think, I think <clears throat> it, it was the beginning of this sort of uh, road to realism. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and and well, if he you was remember, participating in that in his own, um, in that, whatever that book was that they produced back uh, then. Yeah. Yeah. So, real, I mean, he was right in there doing, you know, uh, but, but Tom, in the class of, I mean, this is one of the things that if you're thinking about what Gamma was teaching, was he a, an impressionist or was he not? Was he an academic? Was he, was he a mix? But, um, but Lack, and I've, he, he says it in his own writing in that book. He says, so I decided to paint this impressionistic painting of an interior, but it was so complicated, I decided to do a grisaille first. That doesn't make any sense. No, I know. And so, well, but the point is, you know, Gamble himself talks about getting back, like in the Twilight of Painting, what he wanted, which was the academic information of people like Bouguereau and, and, and Lefebvre or anybody else. And, uh, and I wonder to what extent that's what drew a lot of people near him, that kind of stuff. And that's all they were listening for. But the other side of this, Tom, and maybe you, and you've certainly heard the same thing, and that is that the Impressionist my view of what Gamble does is he, he puts impressionist color in an academic painting. And, uh, and, and that, you know, when, the, when, 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 when Gamble says the school, the, um, the method is the school, you know, mm -hmm. the only person whose work looks like that at all is Paxton. Right. The other guys are, 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 what would you say? They're, they're mass draftsmen much more than they're noodling an outline and that sort of thing. And they don't wind up in the same place. Not, right. not at all. And that just takes nothing away from Paxton. It's a different model, though. And so, you know, that's what the Gamma would continually say. He said it to me probably more than once. Paint as I say, not as I do. Well, that's a pretty tough order, but especially yeah. for somebody who's already gotten his mind to paint imaginative paintings. Right. Um, I, I, I think he recognized the, the value, you know, of the Boston School, you know, the understanding of how to observe nature, how to put it down truthfully. Right. I, I think he understood how valuable it could be and what he wanted to do. And I agree with you. He, he he's he's got one foot in both camps, uh, and he's he's not except with pictures like Addis and Tamas. You know his his right. great masterpieces. Right. You know I think he's he's you know that's his supreme. <laughs> you know, ma masterpiece. Uh, you know, both of those paintings in terms totally of, academic. <laughs> in, in terms of achieving, you know, right. uh, you know, high high end academic, you know, quality uh, yeah. result. Yeah. Master. You know, in, in the storytelling, yeah. and their design and their execution. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I think I do think in the other pictures he's he's got one foot in in both camps, and and it it. You know, it doesn't, it, it's very difficult. Um, you know, sometimes he's very successful at it. Sometimes he's, he's not. Yeah, yeah. Well, his, um, his portrait work is, uh, is solid and all that. You know, there's no yeah. discussing that. But so you worked with, you worked, oh. But I, yeah. I just, just one, I don't, want to, yeah. I don't mean to interrupt, but just one thing, you know, when we were talking about lack, I, I, I do think, you know, the, the, in most cases, the lack students who actually came and studied firsthand with Mr. Gamble were able to undo some of, you know, what Richard Lack's influence did to his other students who never came East. I think, yeah, a, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, people like Gary Hoffman, yeah. you know, the, the distinct difference between him and people from the lack school who didn't come East and study with Mr. Gamble. I think, I, I think they, they developed a better understanding of what impressionist painting is and, you know, the Boston school. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there was no question that uh, significant portions of what Lack was doing contains the same data, it's the same information. That's why I always think what's really happening is you can study with the same guy and all of us, you know, you're, you're stuck with your fingerprints, you know, you are who you are and your right. cultural background and all sorts of stuff that makes you make decisions and, and even to hear things in different ways. But Tom, mm -hmm. you went, um, you went in the course of a still life. So one of the things that my students are doing and yours <laughs> are setting up still lives. Did Gamble lay out any particular guidelines for that? Uh, did he say, do this and do that in terms of how to set up a successful still life? Or was he 
putting you to work and after the fact coming in and having a look at it. It, it was putting us to work and coming in after the yeah. fact. You know, we, as I said before, there was so much going on in the studios. <laughs> you remember the, the studios in those days, it, it was a vibrant place. You know, the, I mean, there were a lot of students working. You had, you know, Bob Hunter, you had Bob Cormier yeah. who were painting. Um, you know, Bob Hunter, I, I, I think, made it easy for a beginning Camel student because, you know, he focused primarily on still lifes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we had that as some sort of, guideline for yeah, a little bit know, of a what model yeah. Yeah. might want sure. uh, in terms of arrangements. But I, I, I distinctly re remember, you know, when I was allowed to paint a still life for the first time, uh, you know, taking a tremendous amount of time to set it up, you know, probably four or five days, maybe even a week, yeah. having come in uh, regularly to look at it, make suggestions, but but yeah. not tell them what to do. Yeah. You know, not going out and finding objects and saying, Right. Oh, I think this would be better. I mean, he he did leave it up to us one hundred percent. Yeah, for what we to, uh, paint. So then, when he would come around and do critical stuff, were were there classic things on his tongue, centers of interest? Uh, do you remember words that were in his framework, color related? Uh, anything in the terms of the setup that he was trying to suggest to you? I'm just doing this. Because I remember right. what I had, and I don't, and I'm only doing it uh, to see if there's a continuity, I guess you would say, between what I got I, from him. And... But what I remember most of all, it, it, more than saying, you know, look for this or, or you know, put this off center or never, he, he never said things like, don't put something in the center. Yes. No, it's true. He, I never heard one of those things. <laughs> I, I, I never, never, ever heard that. But, but I would say, I would, I do remember him saying, you know, this will probably look better here, or, or you know, you should consider moving this, you know, five inches to the right or, or to the left. Um, but but I, I think the, the biggest value, uh, you know, came in our constant visits to the museum, mm. you know, mm. look, looking at good pictures, look, you know, understanding what design was, uh, you know, looking at the, the two Chardin still lights in the museum. Mm. I, I, I think if if I looked at them once with him, and I looked at him, a, you know, ten or twenty times over those, you know, seven or eight years. Sure, sure. Uh, dragged you know, back at the Boston School yeah. to the same to, get to the same yeah. pictures that he was dragged to see. <laughs> it, it, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, composition was a constant mm -hmm. yeah, in in the conversation. Right. Uh, but it, but I do I, I do remember that. There was no, there were no rules. It, it wasn't like we went and studied the composition book. Um, you didn't have dynamic symmetry. <laughs> I don't I'm even kidding know. What, I'm kidding. It probably didn't exist at the time, or came out about then. <laughs> you know, I don't even I'm know. Kidding. What I'm, is. I'm teasing. I'm sorry for you guys out there who love, <laughs> but uh, no, it, but that is. Know, I mean, it's in the class of the formulaic or or a an approach right. that is sort of like I call it instant success uh, thinking. Yeah. You know, or spitball me over the home plate of life, thinking. You know, <laughs> but, but I, I don't. Even, I don't. Honest God, Paul, I don't no. even know what tree is. Yeah, yeah. Oh, good, good. Um, well, no, I, I don't want to get into anything. Um, I, what I wanted to mention, though, is that his con his his comments were in the class, that I, as I'm recalling it, for the purpose of refreshing your memory, or to whatever extent that happens. Of painting is very personal. And, and it's, yeah. I'm sorry, composition is very personal. I didn't say painting was. Composition is very personal. Did you get that conversation? Did he explain it? it, it well, yes. I, I, I mean, I, I, like you, I was terribly interested in composition. And, you know, we, you know, we were told from the very beginning, it, 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 it's not the painting and how you paint it that's important. It's the composition. It's the distribution of lights and darks within the rectangle. There you go. Now you're talking the language we all heard. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and that was it. It's, yeah. it's it's how everything relates, you know, to the four, you know, sides of the picture. Uh, yeah. it, it's how you distribute. You know, it's you know whether you you have a dominating mass, and every everything else leads into that. Uh, you know, and you may need a counterbalance on the on the right <laughs> side. Um, well, he's talking about a particular picture, not a theory. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. He also said, "I teach deductively." By the way, to me, I don't know if he ever said that to you. But and I took that to simply mean that he's going to tell you to do something and he's going to assume that you're going to do it 
and learn what he must have meant. <laughs> well, <laughs> there, was, there was a certain amount of that. Uh, you know, no, no, no question about it. Um, <clears throat> but um, yeah, it, it's it's interesting. You know, there, yeah. there there were no there were no cliches. You know, there were no rules. No, it's uh, true. Yeah. But it, it was the same with an anatomy. You know, it, I'm sure he told you the same thing. Is go learn everything you can about anatomy and, and then forget. forget. <laughs> and then the same with perspective. Yeah. You know, go learn everything you can about perspective and then forget it. Because yeah, it, yeah. It, no, I mean that's an exactly. I don't remember him saying forget it, but I remember taking up five books of each kind <clears throat> and just reading them like stupidly. And I, well, I really got to realize by reading a bunch of them, you got, you got what they had in common. <laughs> and especially if you read it from an artist's uh, framework. Yeah. Uh, not the best but, of which was was uh, Riche, but that was OK. And I read that. But that, a lot of that. I know he was good. He was a painter. He was a draftsman. So it, he, he would have understood that. But I've seen other ones that are actually even more to the point. But Gamble actually handed me a little two or three sheets of paper showing the salient form p points on the body as his anatomy lesson to Paul. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right. I don't remember where he got it. He must have pulled it up out of the trash at some point or another. Another thing he did was he recommended reading. Did you have that? Um, did you have that going on as from him? Right. Well, we, we, as you remember, we were all given our reading ticket to the Athenaeum. Yes, we were. What a, with a presumption we knew what that meant, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I remember being told, you know, you, you must read. I don't care what you read. Just follow your nose. Yeah, and yeah. We'll, we'll talk about it at the end of every week. Oh, he would recommend week. Dante's Inferno as quickly as you'd recommend a book on painting. <laughs> right. In right. fact, I don't, I'm trying to remember any books on painting. He recommended Fromentin, uh, right. Matt, old man. But then he came up with that, uh, something he'd written many years before, which is that list of books, that book review, which has, right. which has a significant number of really valuable books uh, in it. Right. Yeah. And, that, and that, yeah, we all got that list. And, I I remember from the day I was given that list, I, you know, would start going down to the bookstores downtown and scouring the shelves. Mm -hmm. And uh, finally, fifty years later, I, I've uh, I think I've pretty much replicated his library. As you, you know, we, we probably both have exceeded it. Yeah, well, uh, well, sir, it was in certain areas, in some some other areas, like in psychology, I will never exceed his library. No, no, he really no. had a lot of books on, on the subject. Um, no, not at all. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. It, it, it was interesting, that, you know. But as far as the reading goes, there was there was never any. You were never really told what to read. I mean, if you mm -hmm. wanted to read James, or if you wanted to get in good with him, you could read Somerset Mom. <laughs> <laughs> that was his favorite. We did author. read the summing up. Yes, we did whatever we were told that way. Yeah, yeah well, you're right. Yeah. So, exactly. so Tom, a typical. You're you're in there doing a cast. Did you draw a cast with him or just with Hunter? I did. I did. So I, you, you know, you're in there. You're working on a cast. It's set up. Uh, to be in the uh, in a site size orientation, and what sort of a th what would happen in the studio um, that we could that'd be worth hearing out here? What did Gamma Gamma would walk in and and address something or other? I remember well, I, being with you yeah, in some of the figure classes, and it, we all, we had some stunts going on to keep him from saying the same thing to everybody. But <laughs> he, he would he would come in and uh, you know he would be at the top of the stairs and right. you know he would he would pull his handkerchief out and um <laughs> and, it, and then he would he would very slowly walk down the stairs and in a very loud voice i i, I always felt he came with a predetermined criticism uh, something oh, that really he uh, something he felt, needed yeah he felt that day you would need you know based on the prior day's criticism huh. and he would he would start talking about that but uh when, you know when it came to criticizing on the cast I mean, he, he, he was he was very specific. Um, it, it was it was mostly just you know seeing the big shape, seeing the arabesque, you know, get, getting that down. And he would be pointing <laughs> at the back straggler. The word back straggler, of course, is his word. Back, the back yeah. straggler, you know, lo looking looking for the thing that's you know furthest wrong, you know, constantly. Yeah. Uh, but you know, the the biggest value I, I think in that that teaching during those days, you know, the cast was. Uh, you know, coming to understand, you know, what the real division of light and shade was, um, you know, the light having, shadow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, having, you know, the halftone very, you know, as a young student, having it explained very carefully that the halftone is not shadow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, he had aphorisms for all this stuff. You know, the shadows are flat, they're for atmosphere. The lights are not flat or never flat. That's, right, that's right. The, the, light, the form is in the lights and all that. There's a lot of that stuff. It was, he was very it, careful to get it all across. The, yeah. The constant, mm -hmm. uh, you know, quote from uh, Philip Hale, you know, uh, at, when Hale was teaching at the museum school, he, after, he was teaching the figure class. And when he would walk out, he would always turn to the students and he would say, beware of the bed bug line. And most people, <laughs> but I, have you explained to your students what the bed bug line is? Well, I do use it maybe once. I don't, I mean, I have explained, yes, the bugs don't <laughs> like, they don't like light. <laughs> they don't like light. Yeah. So when, when the when the bed bug is, you know, on the shadow side of your pillow and he's crawling oh, up the yeah. pillow towards the light, when, once, once he sees the light. He runs back, yes. He, he runes back. <laughs> and, and that and very fine line between light and shade where the bed bug can see the window. Gemmel's, so, uh, uh, Gemmel was a, a fountain of aphorisms. And I take it that so were people like his uh, namesake, Hale, and other mm -hmm. teachers. Uh, you know, we, you have uh, several that are clearly from DeCamp, others from right. from uh, Tarbell, uh, relating to... One of, the, um, one of the books he always recommended, and I, I still, that's another book. I don't have it on my coffee table, but I always have it close by, is William Morris Hunt, uh, Talks on Art. I, yeah. Um, tra you know, the notes transcribed by Helen Knowlton, yep. uh, all, the, all the quips, phrases, aphorisms uh, <laughs> that Hunt would say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I don't know that Gamel borrowed those. Is there any indication of that? <clears throat> I, I think he did borrow. Oh, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, think, I, I think he constantly read it himself. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a wonderful book. I mean, I, I mean, virtually every sentence, every paragraph is, is full of words of wisdom. I, yeah. I quote it yeah. all the time constantly yeah. and uh, the, the the one quote I like most and you know it's what Mr. Gamble you know was trying to do with his teacher was correct um, you know the bad teaching that we you know we all received right. in the very beginning yeah. and uh, William Ross it, it, the way he phrased it was we are all victims of our first teachers <laughs> <laughs> and, and as Gamble would say we never get over our first teachers <laughs> we, it, it's amazing <laughs> I, I'm sure you still you have students who, you know, still revert back to those uh, days that they spent in art school, you know, doing um, gesture drawing and all of that sort of stuff. Well, <laughs> no, no, I, I, don't, I don't know if I do, but I do have, I do see that people are more victimized by it, by in their, what I'd call their automatic behaviors. And yeah. so I spend a huge amount of my time teaching this idea of training your dog, you know, so your whole automatic world changes. And, uh, and I found it personally that if you do that systematically, you'll eventually eliminate the other world. And um, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean you'll eliminate uh, certain sort of delights about that other stuff and even put it to use from time to time. Mm -hmm. But, but your, your general processing is, you know, it can be elevated by, right. by more knowledge and good schooling of yourself. You know, that's what I mean by discipline, just train the dog. But I, I, yeah. I think, that, you know, the one thing that stands out in my mind, my memory of, you know, his criticism was, you know, is is constantly reminding us that, you know, d don't put something down without thinking, yeah. you know, that, you know, painting is a process of decision making. Mm -hmm. and you, you have to be constantly aware of, you know, solving the problem, looking for the thing that's most wrong and figuring out how to fix it and that. You know, when you do fix that one thing, everything else needs fixing. And and you, I, I what I got from it was, is constantly making you aware that you have to work the, the whole entire drawing or the whole entire painting. All the it, time. It, yeah, yeah. It's not. It's not the parts. Right. It's the sum of the parts. It, it, yeah. And you know, too much effort in any one area, you know, can take away from you know, the sense of unity, which is one of the most important things about any picture. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right, yeah. Um, I uh, had a thought and I lost it. <laughs> it was a good point there, but, uh, Tom. But, but, but he, he, even to the point of, you know, forcing yourself not, once you make the correction to the degree necessary, forcing yourself not to continue because you're having fun or it's exciting or you're getting the desired results, but you know, then going to the next thing that needs... Keep stay on, stay on plan, yeah. 
Yeah, uh, we were just, I just had an interview with, uh, um, side by side in my studio here with Sean last, uh, it probably will be the video right before this one, but that mm. was the entire subject of it. It was this mentality of walkabout, the failure to be there and uh, know exactly what you're doing at all times. The first thing Gamble introduced me to by way of reading was um, was Leonardo. And and I I suspect that he's the first notable uh, scientist of our form, you know, guy who analyzes it and starts giving you data because the line of shadow comes from him. And uh, mm-hmm. Gamble was making a serious point of that. He recommended the book by McCurdy. And I was sitting there reading this book thinking, whoa. And finally, I realized there's a chapter on, <laughs> on that relates to painting. You know, I was, I was pretty determined not to read all of uh, uh, the discourses about the reproductive system or whatever else. Right. <laughs> But anyway, but um, if, yeah, if, um, so that is, a, but that was the first resource. He never leaned on the uh, uh, William Hunt, although I found it to be a very good practical resource. Hunt mm-hmm. always turned me off, and that's just a discussion point, but he, his work itself didn't lend itself. To, and I was a tough, I was a no, tough it, sell. If I didn't like a guy's work, I wasn't going to be, I wasn't right. going to be looking too closely at it, <clears> just saying. But on the other hand, I know it, Gamble yeah. brought him up and, there and is knew a, him, yeah. Exactly. Um, let's see. What else? What, what could I sit you on? Um, if um, so, did Gamble just talk about what Gamble did? Did did he touch your drawings? Did he do anything like that? And I'm going to walk oh, away he, for a second. He, he was very much hands on. I mean, one, one of my most memorable experiences was my first uh, still life painting with him. He he literally uh, <clears throat> after I had done the brown paper drawing. <clears throat> And she lacked it. Uh, he he actually gave me a demonstration on the brown paper drawing, laying in the still life, and I mean, it was it was remarkably good. Um, everything I learned in that picture, it's uh, there are things that I still uh, you know practice today in my own work. He was definitely hands on in every respect, and he, even though there was such a dramatic difference in height, thirteen and a half inches. We, we had the equalizer, which put him on a even plane with, um, you know, my eyesight. My I always opinion. said we're putting him on a pedestal. <laughs> <laughs> we, we did. We literally <laughs> did. Uh, but but even even on the pedestal, you know, he he would make corrections, and I mean, he was absolutely right. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, oh, we had I no mean, eyes at all. There was no reason to ever doubt what he was saying. And by the way, that was my way coming in. I always took it to be. Uh, uh, to, the assumption would be to listen and just presume his rightness. I was never, I was never uh, disabused. I never had a reason to think otherwise. No, he was, no. he was always right on. And, I, and, was, and of course, you didn't know how well he was right on if you didn't follow through. Sometimes he would come in and tell you to do something. Maybe the third time he told you. I remember him saying to me, "You probably heard the same thing." Uh, to err, he is human. To err twice is stupid. Or or I tried to make it very clear. I stood and shouted in his ear. Right. <laughs> you know, he would do that. <laughs> but he would do that. And you'd take it. I mean, I always took those things to heart, meaning I better start listening. Or, and then, right. But I found always that the follow-up, doing what he said, got you into the mind of the painter. You understood what he was doing it for, what it had mm-hmm. to do with the way that where the painting was at the time, that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. It's very revealing. A lot of students don't know how to do that. They want to stay on their track and that sort of thing. The, 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 one, the one thing I found most valuable about his teaching <clears throat> and I, I think it's essential in any any you know good teaching was he would come in and, and if something was off he wouldn't just go in there and make a little correction <laughs> or put him yeah, true away. I mean he he would paint the thing out yeah one I mean it would literally literally wreck it and in his criticism he would bring you know, a portion of it back and then he would leave it to you. Yeah, and, then, yeah. and he would say, did you have fun doing it the first time? <laughs> quoting, you should have as much fun doing it the second time. Quoting Paxton's uh, torture of him. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Which he clarified typically. But, uh, you know, th- those, those criticisms and they were constant, you know, coming in and completely wiping out what you had done. Yeah, you know, you, yeah. you might have a day where you thought, oh, you know, I'm, I'm beginning to understand this. I think I'm doing this pretty well. And he would come in and, you know, he would he would just literally, you know, blot it. Right. He, he would put the paint on in a, yeah. 
a real heavy manner. Uh, yeah. you, know, you, you couldn't retrieve your, uh, you, you know, original burn. You had to redo the thing again. You had to re-see it. You had to repaint it. You had to rethink everything through. Now, it was definitely and, from Gamel that we learned to paint out, to paint the, yeah. to push the paint. lights out into the darks and come back and do the drawing again. Yeah, um, yeah painting, painting in and out. Um, that was, that was, you know, that's the essence of painting. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and I think, I believe Paxton had, uh, you know, one of his most famous quotes was, you're not really painting until you're painting in and out. And, uh, you know, most people don't understand that today. I mean, they may go over the edge a little bit, but, you know. Or come up to the so, edge, you're rather like Bugro used to do frequently. Uh, but but if, if, if you literally paint right through it and then bring, you know, the next value, you know, that that's, uh, that's how... When you look at Paxton's work, you see transitions in values that you can't figure out how they were done. Mm -hmm. But the only way they could be done was painting in and out and yeah. bring, bringing the tones together yeah. as, as opposed to blending the tones. And if you're not painting wet into wet, you're not painting. That was among the other quotes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Tom, exactly. we're going to run out of time. If I And I, and I promised people to show uh, some of your uh, paintings so they would... But I, this gets to be too much fun. Now, we could go on. We haven't even covered the beginning of this of the no, gamble but, experience. But yeah, I, I mean, we we, we can pick it up. Yeah, this and do the pictures at another time if you want. <laughs> well, we could do that actually. Um, unfortunately, I've made the promise. I, I I didn't say it in the title actually. I haven't had it. so when I, I'm standing here now and I haven't titled the picture yet. That still comes. <laughs> I, I, I haven't titled the video but, yet. So whatever you if, like. If you let's oh. let's let's. Um, you know, I think fun. I might do that because I think I wind up, will wind up having to short it too much, get a chance to actually show. But I did start this out telling people I was going to show your work. So maybe, why don't I show at least just one picture? And uh, if I can even successfully share a screen, I mean, this could be a whole joke. Was, but was uh, but I'm going to try to pull up the one, the first one, something you did, I think, if, probably within the uh, strong influence of Gamble and maybe actually with critiques by Gamble, which is that snow picture. You tell me, you, you correct me if that's not so, but... Um, I, I, I did receive criticism from us. I, I thought I remembered that, yeah. Yeah. He, he literally came to the public garden in the, uh, on a, you know, a snowy gray day. Like I said earlier, you know, composition was a constant topic right. of discussion. As, you know, as it has been with you your whole life. Right. What, I, what I believe I got most from him in regard to composition was you know a, a an understanding that it's something you have to constantly study <clears throat> you, you you have to go to the masters you know the past masters to study the best things that have been done in history and then you have to you know try to incorporate it in to what you're doing mm -hmm. um, but the, the one the one phrase that he constantly repeated to me you know, especially with my extreme interest in landscape painting, was that you have to take advantage of the opportunity nature presents mm -hmm. to you. Mm -hmm. And that's something the landscape painter has to do because no two days are, are exactly alike. Uh, you know, we, we make the decision it's going to be a sunny morning picture, you know, for two weeks in June, you know, when the <laughs> sun is at a fairly constant, mm -hmm. you know, height in the sky. But each of those days can bring changes in atmospheric conditions, wind conditions, everything. Especially you know. in Boston. Yeah, exactly. And uh, you know, you know, you may start out with one intention, you know, but as you're developing the picture, certain things may happen or change that can enhance it. Sure. That, that's 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 why working from life is an entirely different thing. I um, mean, you, you know, people say, well, oh. You know, did you paint it from a photograph or whatnot? No, mm -hmm. uh, you, you go out and you observe. You, you <laughs> yeah, there. you're talking the movable face conversation from the, in, with, which you used to describe hair in a portrait, and mm -hmm. and the and of course that you know well, that's the um, Hemingway book, but the movable face um, was don't you see if it changes and it changes for the better, <laughs> look what we've got, and right. and the idea of ever being away from the model when you have that opportunity of actually seeing something in nature that you've never seen before and it's way better than what and even though you what you started out with plausible you know this idea of hanging on hanging on for dear life gamble was, was remarkable of course at his age he probably would have learned to be that way was remarkable 
in his in his expression of keeping your knees bent and, and the flexibility uh, in relation to what changes might happen in the course of a day or a, or a model. Yeah. That, so that was that, a conversation that, you had here in the case of this one as well. Very, very much so. Yeah, that, yeah. You know, the, the actual day, you know, that I <laughs> decided to paint the picture, you know, was beautiful and it was like that. But, you know, you go through periods with the shrinking snow cover or right, right. The days where it's it's just a simply a gray day. And sure. you, you, you have to assimilate, you know, the best of each day. Uh, so a, a, a picture like this is, is a compilation of many, many, many days, you know, where the effect or the lighting effect is relatively the same. But right. like you were just saying, you, you you take advantage of you know the opportunities nature presents you 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 take the best you you put down what works you know pictorially you know what works design wise what well, works color, that, color wise so that so so it did Gamel and by the way Gamel sat when I showed him landscapes and he said I'm not out there I can't judge of the colors but we can talk right. about composition but um, I, I had the benefit of many, many on, on-site criticism. Yeah, um, that's that's good in, stuff. In, yeah. in, in Williamstown in the summer, yeah, uh, you know, he would he would come out every afternoon. He would. Forward, oh no, yeah, yeah, we had that. We all had that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was part of the it was part of the entertainment too. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> uh, but I, but um, I, one of the things that we know about Monet is that his was his is adhering to 20 minutes of a very, very like day. And there's, you get a rigor in that, that implies the impressionist unity of the day. And you could say, well, he was being a bit of a scientist and all that sort of stuff. And there are other things that go on to make a better picture and all that sort of stuff. But right. that's an interesting question though. Um, and the one that really needs, I get the impression with some of what you're seeing in, um, in Benson as a particular, that he was primarily that guy much more than a guy who was taking the day and making sh shift with it. You know what I mean? And, and, and I think what you're dealing, this is one of those things I say to you, I don't mean anything in particular, but the, but the, this is, this picture in particular reminds me of the imaginative painter more than the impressionist, even though it's a moment in space and time and day, you know, weather. Do you see what I mean? And that I, that's what I think is, and that's a very significant value but I would argue that it isn't quite the same thing. But you tell me what you're thinking. Well, it, 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 actually, Paul, you hit the nail on the head. It, you know, it's an impressionist picture. It was painted on site, but it, it, it no, no one day is exactly like that. Yeah. Uh, and and this, this I believe is is what the day feels like more than what the day is like. Mm -hmm. um, no, I, I, I. I I really agree with you. You know, I mean, it, it's very carefully designed. Yep. Uh, you know, it, it, it's not, it's not dashed off, you know, the way, a, you know, someone doing a one shot deal would do, uh, right. you know, the architect was carefully designed, you know, it took great pains to, you know, make sure that, you know, things were, you know, mapped out in a way that the design made great sense. Uh, so in that, in that sense, you know, it, 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 it it's a combination, uh, you know, it's, it's somewhat academic, but you know, it's, it's true to the, uh, yeah. you know, atmosphere. Well, but, but to be precise, that's exactly what I say about Paxton. That's a Paxton model. <laughs> right. Right. I don't, I don't think, I don't think that's actually a, a model. And not, and by the way, everybody who paints impressionistically has to do some of that. It's not like that you can get out of it because, you know what I mean? If you want to push a painting, you, you right. can't, so that's not, I'm not saying that. Right, but right. Uh, yeah well in, in in a cityscape like this also you know it's it's a whole different set of problems uh it, it, people walking about through it and all that sort of stuff with, sure, people, sure. You know, with architecture you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. perspective involved um you you know which can be a great aid in you in solving the design problems sure, uh sure. architecture you know stationary objects uh, you know, distributing them and patterning them, you know, within the picture in a manner that, uh, you know, you know, makes, makes it interesting and, you know, pleasing to the eye. Sure. Absolutely. Or, you know, tells the story. Hey, did, um, when Gamel stood out there then, was he critiquing your color relations or was he primarily critiquing your composition on the spot? 
Um, a, a, a really, composition. Um, you know, because I, I mean, you you know yourself well. I mean, you know, the placement of you know that bridge and you know those lights and the figures and whatnot. You know, it, it's all slightly. You know, it's it's right of center, and uh, you know, it, if that had been, you know, placed, you know, fifteen degrees, ten degrees to the left, mm -hmm. you know, it would be. Picture, you so know, he was in that conversation about placement of yeah. the center of interest and all. Yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah. Exactly. Right. yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, right. I mean, you know, you know, uh, Tom, how practical that is, though, to the viewer. You know that. <laughs> it, you know, when you can only be there vicariously, we're trying to do that all the time. With you know, what did what did what did Carol Duran say? What did what did Sergeant say? <laughs> what did Monet say? Yeah. It, and it, it, it really does rather matter a bit. And you need, you know, it's, a, it's an introduction that people can't have firsthand, but they could have it if we carry on a conversation. So it's pretty cool. I really appreciate but, your letting me do this to your picture, too. No, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Not that it doesn't yeah. deserve it. It's a very beautiful picture. Oh, no, I, I appreciate it. But, um, yeah, it, it's, you know, it's, it's all, it, again, it's all about the design. Hey. It's all about. The patterning. So, so patterning. Now, you just used the word I was about to bring up. Describe patterning in this picture the way Gamma would have talked about it. Where, 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 where what, uh, apropos of which area of this picture are we talking patterning? Or is it something else? Well, I, 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 you know, I think we mentioned it earlier. You know, the, the distribution of lights and docks, you know, within the rectangle, you know, so, you know, very simple things, you know, making sure that. You know the, the snow cover area that you, you know with the snow on the ground right it, as you can see it at no point does that go above the halfway point you know it's it's probably one third up and it, it you know that's a conversation it, you had with uh gamel yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, you, you know the, the 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 mass of the um <clears throat> the tree and buildings on the left side uh, you know, do dominating the picture and, and, the, and the right side being lower and mm -hmm. more interesting with, you know, shapes cut, cutting into the sky. Mm -hmm. uh, just, you know, never, never having things repeat in a way yeah. Yeah. that they look staccato, you know. They, monotonous, yeah, yeah. Not, yeah, exactly, monotonous. Uh, you know, the, you know the, the little, you know, fence on the right and left side of the walkway you know, the, on the right side, you know, it all, almost becomes one mass, one shape. And on the, on the left side, you know, they're, they're patterned in a way that they, it, it, it's essential in terms of leading you into the center of interest of the picture. Right. Uh, but, yeah, you know, more, more than, um, you know, saying do this, do that, uh, you know, it, it was really, you know, t taking, taking, you know, everything that you had learned um, it, everything that you saw in better pictures, you know, by better painters right. and, you know, applying it to your own work. Um, you know, when, um, you, I, I remember, you, you know, right, right from the very beginning, I always had an interest in cityscapes and, right. you know, and, um, I remember him, you know, pushing me towards Canaletto, you know, study Canaletto, mm -hmm. uh, you know, no, no one did it better in terms of architecture and, you know, complicated, you know, cityscapes and, and whatnot. Um, you know, it, you, you know, so, you know, as much as this is a snow scene, you, you know, you're, you're thinking of painters like that. Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But, uh, you, you know, to, to get back to Monet, uh, you know, I, I think there was a, you know, probably like a 20 year period where, you know, he, he really was able to, you know, paint some remarkable pictures that have a staggering amount of truth. Um, but, it, you know, it, just because something is a Monet, you know, doesn't necessarily yeah. mean it's a piece. It's, uh, it's a work of art. <laughs> 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 well, no, I, I, you know, it always has been sort of a curious thing and you do wonder what he meant toward the end of his life when he was having some, some thoughts about what he didn't do. But, uh, and it does strike me that it's about composition in significant ways, but it wasn't that he wasn't aware and wasn't doing stuff. Uh, significant numbers of those things are uh, like the harbor. I think it's in at, uh, in um, in Venice. I mean, some of those things are as nice as composition gets in their way, mm -hmm. yep. but in the same distribution of spotting and all that stuff, and the distribution of color and all that. But no, yeah, I was only mentioning. Yeah, sorry. 
No, I, I do think that's what separates the Boston painters. You know, we, we've talked about it many times. You know, they, they drew better. You know, they, you know, having had that academic training, right. uh, then, you know, they were able to assimilate, you know, the impressionist point of view of the way Monet, yeah. you know, presented it in a way that they were actually able to make better pictures. You know, they, they, yeah. they were able to push them. Well, I do think the uh, Boston guys, uh, Gamble's, Gamble calls it the greatest evolution or whatever of, of impressionism, but, you know, and then he says, but then but Velasquez is really still the best. <laughs> I can understand saying, as you take Pax at Velasquez as a man, he clearly is as a painter, he's, a, he's, he's definitely bigger than I, any of the Boston School guys taken, taken and as a single unit. But, but when you talk about what the, what the Boston School brought to the game, and it isn't, and this is where I really separate from Paxton, and I want to get your feedback on this. It isn't, um, it isn't that he's applied their color in good drawing. It's that he, that they, inco- that they incorporated, I think Benson, that, they, that he incorporated uh, silhouette which is a real function of the day that you're sitting right. in, sharp edges and stuff. They, they have, they're more holistic about the visual impression. So Monet was just, he was glued to this color, do it all with color, do it all with color. And I honestly right. believe that what he regretted at the end of his life was, was that he, he didn't grasp the whole of the problem. Uh, and, and yet, you know, what he did really just changes everything in all of painting, of course, for, from that point forward. But do you follow what I mean? And that's, so I don't, Paxton didn't do that. Paxton painted a good academic painting and, um, and, and he, but he did it with beautiful. I mean, as beautiful as any of the Boston school guys, impressionist color. I mean, straight up, but, exactly. but it is not, it is not the same mentality. You know, like I say about Benson, you can feed, feed off this, but what I say about Benson, he, he takes all the horses. He, so he gets silhouette going at the beginning. He doesn't. He doesn't just do a color thing and then gradually work up some drawing and bring it, squeeze it in. They set up all the horses at once, and you know that's where you really appreciate it because silhouette is a horse, if you want to exactly. put it that way. You know what I mean? It's it's not just the color of the values. It's what happens where they meet, and these guys are fully incorporated with that. Do you follow what I'm saying and think think with me on that? Absolutely. I I mean it's one of the things I admire most about De Camp. I mean, how often have you seen a you know, a head or a portrait or interior where the head silhouettes, you know, against the, the backlight and it's it's almost razor sharp. But then as it dissipates, you know, into the penumbra of light down below, right. Right. You, you you can't tell where anything is. It, yeah. It's so, um, you know, it, it it's the embracing of, you know, you know, being truthful to what's actually happening as opposed to, painting what you think should happen. Right, right. Yeah, I call it that, that part, I call the new world order of the ages. <laughs> it says the, what it says on the dollar, you know. But, I, but it, it's, <laughs> like, it's like today when people tell me, you know, they're going to take care of their edges, you know, going to soften up the edges. Right. I mean. <laughs> no, it's too late. It's too late. If that's what you're going to start doing. That, that, that's, it, it wasn't in the game from the beginning. It, but that, in fact, Tom, that happened to me in a conversation with Gamel, and I asked him about the edges in the picture, and he says, oh, you can fix them up later. He really said that. And then I said, well, who should I look at? And he sent me over to look at Chardin. Well, so I looked at Chardin, and he didn't fix them up later. They're obviously fully incorporated from the beginning. Right. Now, right. early Chardin, yes, he drew outlines and junk, you know what I mean? Right. But early Velasquez too. But you know, when you see in Velasquez at the end, is you see a lost and found world from the start. It's exactly. very evident that, and that's what there's more. What shall we say? More inclusive about the Boston School stuff. They didn't just sit on Monet, but they had that um, that Velasquez model sitting there as well. Exactly. That's yeah. Cool. No, I, yeah. I. I think you're absolutely absolutely right. Well, you've made a beautiful postcard here. <laughs> You'd be insulted. If Gavel said that to you, it would be an insult, but I don't mean it that way. <laughs> I know you came out with a box of cards once with this among them. It was very, very nice. Maybe you still oh, sell those. Do you still sell those? The, 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 this picture it has its own life. I mean, <laughs> sure. It's never. It's been a print yeah. for, it's been a print too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it deserves it. It's very nice. You know, if, uh, you know, if you didn't have that, uh, uh, was it Hassam? I forget that evening in the park. You know, this, oh, yeah. is, this is equally as iconic, uh, Tom. So it's a nice job. Hey. Great job. Right. Yeah. I appreciate it. Hey, we're going to have to leave. Uh, you want to you wanna have a last word or anything like that? Any thoughts on your mind about anything we've talked about? Or I want to um, congratulate you on your studio, by the way, and having a, you finally started teaching full time. 
Oh yeah, no, it, it's it's well, you, you you've been doing it for much longer than I have. It, it's so important. We, you know, we yeah. we have to reach this uh, younger generation. Yeah. And one of the interesting things I, I will end on this note, um, you, you know, simply because it's so difficult to reach the the twenty thirty year olds. You know, they're the victims of art schools and whatnot. Yeah. You know, we, I've actually started a high school program where, where we have oh. four towns. We have uh, students come in for five or six hours on a Saturday yeah. and and draw draw from the flat, you know, copying very good drawings. And now some of them are starting to draw from the cast. And, you know, when you when you can start with them when they're 15, 16 years old, mm -hmm. it's remarkable. You know, yeah. when, so you're getting them on a one day a week basis, these guys now? Yeah, and, yeah. and, and whatever now, works. I mean, I, I've always I've always despised that. When I was a high school kid, I wanted no part of high school, so I spent most of my day in the sculpture studios. But, mm -hmm. but you know, it's really screwed up our system to make people go through this stupid, this well, stupid. The, you know, I'm not talking about reading and writing, which are crucial, but you can get all right. that stuff out of the way by the time you're in fifth grade. But that sure. there's a whole different model where you teach instead of teaching history about wars, why don't you teach history based on painting if you're interested in painting? And then you can cover all the wars and the stupid kings and the, and the vicious bankers and all that junk. You know, you can do all that stuff based on a area of interest. And you're going to you're going to it's going to have more glue for you. I'm just talking really, uh, you know, upset. But kids yeah. are wasting their time in school, literally. And I would if a kid left school and said, I'm going to just paint with you, I'd say, I'm, I'm with you. Just do it. But make sure yeah. you can read. <laughs> make sure you can add and read. <laughs> That's right. Um, yeah, the whole notion of a class. The, oh, the, gee, I know. The, the class where you you, know, you punch in at two o'clock and leave at three, and, and then you punch it, in the answers at the end. You all get the same answers and all this whole yeah, it's a jolly good, right? <laughs> I, you know, you know, paint, painting is it's a it it has to be taught on a one to one basis. Right. You know, in association with other people who are doing it. Yeah. You know, at the same time, at, at various levels. You yeah. know, so that. It, can, well, that's the correct atelier model. Today, there's a whole bunch of people teaching, and they're really schools, and they're not even close to that. I mean, you're being right. taught by people who aren't even pros, and aren't, aren't, who aren't solid. They're it's, students it, it, of students that aren't even out of their crib yet, practically. A lot of that right. stuff, it's a big, big, big mistake to be doing that, to have to try to get information through these, you know, offshoots of offshoots. Uh, and, you know, Gamble said the institutionalization of education is what's killing us. It's the institute. Everybody wants to teach a school. And everybody wants to run a school. Why do you want to do that? Just become yeah. a good painter and find two or three kids. Come on. Yeah. It's, it's uh, unnatural. It, Come on. <laughs> yeah. when it, I, I get a kick out of it. You know, people ask, inquire about my teaching and they, they say, well, when are the classes? You know, <laughs> I, yeah, I want to sign up for the classes. Yeah. No, you. It's not a it, school. It, Stop doing that. It, it's it, not a school. If you join us, you get a key, and you can come in at seven a.m. and you can work till sunset. Yeah, and uh, someone will be here to criticize you. Yeah, that's the model. <laughs> that's, it. that's I've been doing that for forty years. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, Tom, thank you. Uh, we'll pick up again. Great fun, Paul. Thank you. Okay, so thank you again to Stephen Jay, our our good Irish friend, and um, for your support for this week's show, and. Um, Keep, for the rest of you, keep, please keep your, uh, you know, your, your, your likes, your shares, your subscriptions, your, uh, and your donations. Uh, keep them coming if you would. And I'm also, of course, very interested in any commentary related to this video that might enable us to go forward with a couple more of these. Tom and I are talking about doing just that. So uh, maybe perhaps making a little bit of a series out of it. So if you bring questions or discussion points to us, uh, you know, the, about what you, you know, about our backgrounds, about Gamble, about, uh, or anything else related to the, what you're seeing or what you just saw, please, please um, put them in the commentaries down below. And um, I would love to follow up uh, and um, with your, you know, for your benefit. All right. So thank you very much. Um, and we'll see you in the next one.